Hello and welcome to this news live from Islamabad. I'm Jawad Tehami and these are the headlines. Pakistan has summoned a senior Indian diplomat to protest ceasefire violations by Indian troops along the line of control. In a statement, the Foreign Office said a civilian was martyred and three others injured in the Rakhchikri and Kanja sectors. Earlier, Pakistan's army said it targeted Indian army posts in retaliatory fighting. UN Human Rights Chief Michelle Bachelet says an alleged massacre in Ethiopia's Tigray region may amount to war crimes. In a statement, Bachelet warned that there is a risk the situation will spiral out of control, leading to heavy casualties. This comes after Amnesty International said hundreds of civilians are believed to be massacred in the restive Tigray region. Aung San Suu Kyi, the leader of Myanmar's ruling party, has won enough parliamentary seats to form the next government. Official results say the National League for Democracy has taken 346 of the 412 seats so far. The country's election body says the results of the remaining 64 seats will be announced soon. The headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. And now with the news in detail. Pakistan has summoned a senior Indian diplomat to register a protest over ceasefire violations along the line of control. In a statement, the Foreign Office said a civilian was martyred due to Indian fighting in the Rakhchikri and Kanja sectors. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs said three others were seriously injured. It says occupation forces are targeting civilian settlements with artillery fire, heavy caliber mortars and automatic weapons. The Foreign Office added that India has committed 2,729 ceasefire violations in 2020. It mentioned that the violations led to the martyrdom of 21 civilians and injured 206 others. Earlier, Pakistan's army said it responded effectively by targeting Indian army posts. The UN Human Rights Chief Michelle Bachelet says an alleged massacre in Ethiopia's Tigray region may amount to war crimes. Bachelet has warned that there is a risk that the situation will spider out of control, leading to heavy casualties. This comes after Amnesty International said hundreds of civilians were massacred in the restive Tigray region. The rights group says it has not yet been able to confirm who was responsible for the killings. But witnesses blame forces loyal to Tigray People's Liberation Front. Meanwhile, the UN said more than 14,000 Ethiopian refugees have crossed into Sudan since the violence broke out. Fighting between government forces and the TPLF broke out last week. Aung San Suu Kyi, the leader of Myanmar's ruling party, has won enough parliamentary seats to form the next government. Official results confirm the National League for Democracy has taken 346 of 412 seats so far. The main opposition party, the Union of Solidarity and the Development Party has won 24 seats. The USDP has raised objections and demanded free, fair and unbiased elections as soon as possible. The Election Commission has denied any allegations of irregularities. The country's election body says the results of the remaining 64 seats will be announced soon. Nobel Peace Laureate Suu Kyi's government faces criticism of the genocide of Rohingya Muslim minority. In the Philippines, the death toll from Typhoon Vamco has jumped to 39, while more casualties are feared. Military officials say 32 people are still missing, while eight others have been injured. Philippine National Police said more than 100,000 people had been rescued, including 41,000 in the capital. Vamco passed north of Manila between the Bulacan and Pampaganga provinces, it toppled electricity poles and trees and damaged homes. At least 3.8 million households lost power in the most populous Luzon Island. 
Vamco hit the Philippines on the heels of Tycoon Typhoon Goni, one of the strongest typhoons in the world this year. China has congratulated the U.S. President-elect Joe Biden, who won the third November presidential election. Addressing the media, Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin said Beijing respects the choice of the Americans. President Donald Trump has so far refused to concede defeat in the election, making unsubstantiated claims over voter fraud. But a senior U.S. election official says the election was the most secure in American history. China is one of the last major countries to officially acknowledge Biden's victory in the presidential election. The U.S. has banned American investments in Chinese firms, which Washington believes have ties to the Chinese military. The bar is to go into effect in January. In an executive order, President Donald Trump accused China of exploiting U.S. investors to finance the development of its military. Talking to the media, White House Trade Advisor Peter Navarro said the order will choke off American capital to China's militarization. The order prohibits U.S. investors from buying shares of 31 Chinese companies. Friction between the two countries has escalated on a range of issues, including South China Sea, COVID-19 and trade. The U.S. Commerce Department has paused a ban on TikTok, which was due to come into effect on November the 12th. The department says it has delayed the ban after a court decision on November 1st and pending further legal developments. President Donald Trump has called for banning the video blogging app, accusing it of data collection and breach. U.S. officials have termed the app as a threat to national security. But a U.S. federal court suspended the ban, asking the government to provide more evidence for its petition to block the app. The Justice Department says it has appealed to Pennsylvania's court on the decision. Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has rejected any attempts to link Islam with terrorism. In a speech, the Crown Prince said Saudi Arabia will continue to confront any extremist manifestations and ideas. His remarks follow the rising incidence of Islamophobia across Europe. He said the kingdom will strike with iron fist against any security threats. Earlier, ISIS claimed the responsibility for the bomb blast that struck World War I commemoration at a cemetery in Saudi Arabia. Paris says French forces have killed Ba'ag Moussa, a military leader of Al-Qaeda's North Africa wing in Mali. The former Malian army colonel was designated as a terrorist by the United States. Moussa was killed after an operation involving ground troops and helicopters. Armed Forces Minister Florence Pali said Moussa was held responsible for many attacks against Malian and international forces. Pali called it a major success in the fight against terrorism. French President Emmanuel Macron has offered to help build a lasting and a just solution of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. In a statement, the presidential office said Macron spoke to Armenian Prime Minister Nicole Pashinyan over the phone. The statement said Macron has expressed satisfaction over the ceasefire agreement and reiterated friendship with Armenia. It said Macron asserted he is ready to find a solution which will be acceptable for all the parties involved. Meanwhile, Turkey has warned Armenia it will have to bear consequences if it violates the ceasefire. Earlier on Wednesday, Ankara and Moscow agreed to jointly operate a center to oversee peace in Nagorno-Karabakh. Turkey says it has neutralized 14 militants of the Kurdistan Workers' Party in northern Syria. The Defense Ministry says they were trying to infiltrate areas where Ankara is carrying out anti-terrorism operations. In a tweet, the Defense Ministry said Ankara will not allow the terrorists to disturb peace and security in the Peace Spring region. Operation Peace Spring is among the three launched by Turkey across its border with Syria since 2016. 
At least 74 migrants have died in a shipwreck off the coast of Libya. The UN Migration Agency says the Europe-bound boat was carrying over 120 migrants, including women and children. It's that 31 bodies have been retrieved so far, while the search for the remaining victims continues. This tragedy is the latest in the series of at least eight shipwrecks in the central Mediterranean since last month. Nearly 800 people have died while trying to reach Europe this year. In Pakistan, COVID-19 has claimed 37 more lives overnight, pushing the death toll to 7,092. The health ministry says 2,304 tested positive for the virus overnight. The ministry said there are over 23,500 active COVID-19 cases in the country. It said out of nearly 352,000 countrywide cases, more than 321,000 have recovered. The ministry said more than 153,000 cases have been detected in Sindh province, while Punjab has reported some 108,000 cases. In the capital Islamabad, over 23,000 people have been infected so far. Brazil has registered 908 daily deaths from COVID-19, pushing the toll over 164,000 with nearly 6 million infections. Over there in India, the virus has claimed 547 more lives overnight, taking the death toll over 128,000. The countrywide infections have crossed 8.7 million as nearly 45,000 tested positive in the last day. Now, the global death toll from coronavirus is approaching 1.3 million with more than 52 million infections. What in this report? With almost a year since the first COVID-19 case was detected, much of the world paints the scenario of ghost towns. Places once steaming to welcome the festive season are under blanket lockdowns now. France and Germany have extended curbs indefinitely, with the rate of coronavirus hospitalizations higher than ever. The crisis has spun out of control in Italy, with patients being treated in their cars as hospitals run out of spaces in Naples. In the UK, authorities have also implied an extension of restrictive measures after lockdown ends on December 2nd. Clearly, when we come out of lockdown uh, in December, and of course that is quite rightly a matter for our elected representatives, uh, we will not, going back, not be going back completely to normal. There will need to be other measures in place uh, because while this virus is still here, we need to ensure that infection rates stay as low as possible. Over in the Americas, the virus continues to batter the North and South alike. While Mexico and Peru fast approach 1 million infections, Brazil, Argentina and Colombia remain the worst hit states. As the holiday season unfolds in the U.S., authorities in California have warned of critical times ahead. I am concerned that we are in a critical time and that we could see amplification from Halloween, more cases, then suddenly that means more opportunities for exposure during Thanksgiving, which then means more uh, in the Christmas time and period. Meanwhile, Moscow has hinted at imposing additional restrictions as daily deaths in Russia spike. Japan recorded its highest ever daily cases, but the government has ruled out imposing an emergency at present. More stories to follow, but right after a short break, stay tuned. Welcome back. The UN says Libya's warring sides will reopen the main coastal road connecting the country's east and west across front lines. It said the reopening is part of a ceasefire deal agreed last month. A member of the UN's Libya mission said the two sides will immediately begin removing landmines and withdrawing fighters from the area. Foreign fighters and mercenaries are to be transferred to Tripoli or Benghazi before departing Libya by 23rd of January. The two sides set up a joint military commission meeting in the frontline city of Sarat. Earlier, the warring sides agreed to hold elections within 18 months in a major breakthrough. In Yemen, Houthis have seized 326 humanitarian aid containers belonging to the World Food Programme. The rebels accused the UN Food Agency of sending expired food and medicines to the war-torn country. Houthi media agency Al Masaira said the supplies will be sent back to the World Food Program. It said the humanitarian aid reaches Hodada port late as WFP deliberately takes the longer route via collation ports. The UN's food agency has not commented on the issue so far. The UN has declared a Yemen situation as the worst humanitarian crisis with over 20 million at the risk of famine. 
In Mexico, one lucky jaguar has returned to wild in a secluded biosphere park after being struck by a car. Environmentalist organizations have called it a success. The male jaguar suffered from a broken left shoulder blade and body lesions after being hit by a car on June 11th. Veterinarians at the zoo coaxed the big cat back to health over several months until it was ready to return. A coalition of environmental organizations and government authorities participated in the jaguar's release into the San Khan Biosphere Reserve. The International Fund for Animal Welfare and the release was monitored via satellite collar. Iraq has started closing refugee camps, housing tens of thousands of people. Many who live there include those who fled their homes during the final battle against ISIS. But aid groups warn the closure of these camps can create a second wave of displacement with dire consequences. What in this report? Located 25 kilometers south of Mosul, Hamam al Alil is one of several camps due to shut this month. Authorities say the operation had been scheduled for earlier this year but was delayed due to coronavirus pandemic. None of that means much to the 50-year-old Umme Ahmed, for whom the situation is extremely difficult. I will be destroyed and struggle once I go out. Now winter is coming and I don't have anything. I will go out with my clothes, me and my abaya only. Aid organizations say it will be harder to reach the most vulnerable if they are spread across the country. Some can face violence and arrest on returning home if they have relatives who were affiliated with armed groups and a few don't even have identification papers. 25% of the 4,900 people who already left the camp are children under the age of 5. 65% of them are minors below 18 years of age. The percentage is very high. As you said, those who have no identification papers don't have access to any services, including schools or education. Around 100,000 people are at risk of becoming homeless as the closures were not properly planned and coordinated. With nowhere to go and a winter fast approaching, many are rightly worried about their future. Well, South Korea has conducted a test run of the world's first drone taxi in the capital city of Seoul. Seoul Metropolitan Government said the country's urban air mobility service will be launched officially in 2025. It said the drone EH216 from China's Ehang company landed successfully, carrying 80 kilograms of rice bags instead of a passenger. The metropolitan government said the vehicle flew over downtown Seoul at an altitude of 50 meters for seven minutes. The taxi will be able to carry two people. Seoul aims to relieve traffic congestion based on eco-friendly electric power and low noise in comparison to helicopters. In Brazil, two men have invented a new way of getting around by motorized broomsticks, taking inspiration from the famous Harry Potter. They say they invented the broomsticks to avoid the famously traffic-choked streets of Megalopolis, Sao Paulo. What in this report? Move over Harry Potter, for a Brazilian duo is turning heads by coasting down Sao Paulo on broomsticks. Vinicius Sanctus and Alessandro Russo have attached the broomsticks to a single motorized wheel. The rider can steer by leaning in the direction they wish to travel. The broomsticks reach top speeds of up to 60 kilometers per hour. Freeing. It's a freeing feeling. You feel like you're actually flying. You glide through the streets, you know. It kind of requires a lot of balance, but once you get it, it's pretty much amazing. So far, the brooms are largely limited to personal use, but the founders plan to market and sell them for about $743 each. Our final goal is to sell the brooms to the world and maybe create a new variation of the Quidditch sport, which will actually be played in brooms, on brooms, and will look a lot like the one played in the Harry Potter movies. The creators say people will be able to play a game using the brooms resembling the ones in Quidditch, the dominant sport in J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter universe. Ferrari has launched the new SF90 Spider convertible version of its SF90 Stradale hybrid. The car maker has pledged to make 60% of vehicle sales from hybrid technology by 2022. 
The SF90 Spider is the eighth new model out of the 15 Ferrari promised in the 2018-2022 plan. The new car features a 780 horsepower eight-cylinder combustion engine. It has two front-mounted electric motors which add an extra 220 horsepower. The car comes with a retractable hardtop and moves at the top speed of 340 kilometers per hour. The SF90 can deliver 25 kilometers of silent electric-only power allowing customers a quiet drive without emissions. As lockdown restrictions caused closure of markets and bars in Germany, a Bavarian innkeeper has opened a drive through Christmas market. The place gives a complete look with artificial snow that falls as customers drive through. What in this report? People are desperately looking for new ways to celebrate Christmas amid coronavirus restrictions to keep the holiday spirit alive. Around 160 million visitors usually descend on Germany's 2,500 Christmas markets each year. But many have been called off this year due to the coronavirus pandemic. Patrick Schmidt is trying to recreate the same Christmas market festive feeling in Munich with a different scheme. The idea was spontan. It was a spontaneous idea because of the second lockdown. I thought restaurant drive-ins also work, so why not a Christmas market drive-in? So we set up this within a week and today it's the opening day. The market organizer says for Christmas he wants the coronavirus control and he hopes the next year is halfway normal again. Schmidt's drive through has also helped lift the mood of customers. <laughs> Germany is in the midst of a month-long lockdown as the cases of coronavirus surge in the country. European stocks are trading mixed due to surging COVID-19 cases, mounting restrictions and reluctant optimism over a vaccine. The pan-European stock 600 and Frankfurt's DAX have dipped slightly under the flat line. London's FTSE shed around half a percent. Meanwhile, the CAC 40 in Paris and Italy's FTSE MIB have gained marginally. Earlier, all Asian bourses closed in the negative territory with the exception of Seoul's Kospi. Another weather situation from around the globe. That's all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at in the stock. News.